On today's story session, a tale about a thief who tries to catfish an entire kingdom. This is The Robber Bridegroom. My name is Zach Stewart, and these are the Shadow Bear Story Sessions. Welcome to the Shadow Bear Story Sessions, the podcast about how brutally dark and totally insane folk tales and fairy tales used to be, which in my opinion just made them way better and more entertaining. So I've got the most true to the original version of Grimm's Fairy Tales that I could find, and we're going through it front to back, story by story. We'll figure out the more obscure lessons that we can learn from each story, and at the end of each episode, I'll adapt the tale into a movie or a TV show. Let's get right to it with today's tale titled, The Robber Bridegroom. We begin. A princess was pledged to marry a prince, and he asked her many times to come once and visit him in his castle. But since the way to the castle led through a large forest, she continually refused because she feared she might lose her way. Why can't the prince just go to her and then bring her back? Or just get someone who knows the way to go with her? There are some pretty easy and obvious solutions to this problem. If that was her concern, the prince told her, he would readily help her by tying a ribbon on each tree so that she could easily find her way. All right, you're overthinking it, prince. Too convoluted. Also would involve a lot of ribbon. He'd have to to make the journey to tie the ribbons anyway, so at that point, he's already going there. Just bring her back with you, buddy. Come on. Nevertheless, she tried to postpone the trip for some time, since she inwardly dreaded it. Finally, she couldn't make any more excuses, and had to set out one day on her journey. Again, why does she have to make this journey alone? I mean, it's a forest, and she's a princess traveling on her own. That seems very unnecessarily dangerous, regardless. There's probably thieves and bears and all kinds of shit out in that forest. Just stop torturing this poor woman, and just go along with her, prince. It's almost cruel of the prince at this point. We continue. It took her the entire day to walk through a long, long forest. Okay, a whole day walking, that's like an hour or two on a horse, right? You could do this pretty quick. Make this easy on her. When she finally arrived at a large house, everything was quiet inside, and only an old woman sat in front of the door. Can you tell me whether the prince, my bridegroom, lives here? It's good, my child, that you have come now, responded the old woman, because the prince is not at home. Before your arrival, I had to fetch water and pour it into a large kettle. They want to kill you, and afterward, they'll cook you and eat you. (sighs) Okay, here we go. Just as she was saying this, the prince could be seen returning from a robbery with his villainous band of robbers. And this would be a huge twist if it weren't completely given away by the title of the story. Fortunately, the old woman took pity on the princess because of her youth and beauty. And before anyone had noticed her, she said, Quick, go down into the cellar and hide yourself behind the large barrel. The implication here is that if she was old and not as good looking, the old woman would not have cared. No sooner did the princess dash down into the cellar than the robbers also went down there, dragging an old woman whom they had captured. And who the other old lady probably didn't feel bad for because she wasn't young and beautiful. The princess saw clearly that it was her grandmother, for she could see everything that happened from her corner without being noticed. Is nobody in the princess's kingdom keeping an eye on the princess's grandmother? I mean, this grandmother would either be royalty herself, or at the very least related to royalty, so you'd think she'd have some security or someone keeping an eye on her. And really, this is a bad move from this thief prince. You don't capture the grandmother of the girl you're trying to impress and get to come visit you. Man, the robbers grabbed hold of the grandmother, killed her, and pulled off all the rings from her fingers, one after the other. However, The gold ring on one of her fingers wouldn't come off, so one of the robbers took a hatchet and chopped off the finger, but the finger sprang behind the barrel and fell right into the princess's lap. 
After the robbers had searched in vain for the finger a long time, one of them spoke out. Has anyone looked behind the large barrel? It's better if we continue searching when there's more light, another said. Early tomorrow morning, we'll continue looking. Then we'll soon find the ring. Well, that is very convenient for our heroine here. And if I were in this group, I'd be like, why don't we just look now? I mean, the large barrel is literally right over there. We've looked everywhere else, so we know it's there behind the large barrel. I mean, we've got candles and stuff. I mean, we might even forget about it tomorrow, so let's just look now, maybe? I feel like that's that's the obvious answer here, instead of let's break and go to sleep. But no, everyone's like, we've had a long day, and it's a little dim, even though we definitely must have candles. Let's just put a pin in this one and finish looking behind the barrel tomorrow. We continue. Soon thereafter, the robbers lay down to sleep in the cellar. Why are they sleeping down there? We know this is a large house. Why would they sleep in the cellar alongside the body of an old woman that they just killed? And as they were sleeping and snoring, the bride came out from behind the barrel. The robbers were lying there all in a row, and she had to step over the sleeping men until she came to the door. She cautiously entered the rooms in between, and she was constantly afraid that she might wake someone. But fortunately, nothing happened. And once she reached the outside door and was in the forest again, she followed the ribbons, for the moon shone brightly, up to the time that she managed to reach her home. <laughs> I like how they were like, she was constantly afraid that she might wake someone, but fortunately nothing happened. It seems like a missed opportunity for some suspense. Or action. You don't see that in many movies or TV shows where someone is in, in a really tense, ominous, dangerous situation. But then, fortunately, nothing happens and everyone's fine. We continue. She told her father everything that had happened to her, and he immediately gave orders for an entire regiment to surround the castle as soon as the bridegroom was to arrive. So I guess they're expecting him to follow after. The soldiers did as he ordered. Then the bridegroom came the same day and asked right away why the princess had not come to him as she had promised to do. Then she said, I had such a dreadful dream. I dreamt I came to a house where an old woman was sitting in front of the door, and she said to me, What a good thing it is, my child, that you have come now, because nobody is home. And I must tell you, I had to carry water to a large kettle. They want to kill you, and then boil and eat you. And as she was speaking... The robbers came home. Then, before anyone could notice, the old woman said, Quick, go down into the cellar and hide behind the large barrel. No sooner did I hide behind the barrel than the robbers came down the cellar stairs and dragged an old woman with them. Then they grabbed hold of her and murdered her. Okay, they're we're really recapping the whole thing here. Punch it up a little, princess. You're trying to build suspense, and this is, this is just dragging on a little bit. After they had murdered the old woman, they pulled off all the rings from her fingers, one after another but they couldn't pull off the gold ring from one of the fingers, so one of the robbers grabbed a hatchet and chopped off the finger, which flew into the air and fell behind the barrel right into my lap. And here is the finger. Upon saying this, the princess suddenly drew the finger from her pocket, and when the bridegroom heard and saw all this, he became chalk-white from fright. He immediately thought of fleeing and jumped through the window. However, there were guards standing beneath the window. They caught the bridegroom and his entire band of robbers. All of them were executed as payment for their villainy. The end. All right. I like that they all jumped through the window, but there were guards waiting right there. Nice move, princess. Okay, first question. How did this guy convince the king that he was a prince in the first place and to let him marry the princess? And how drunk was this king that he did literally no research on where this guy came from and if he's even a prince. Because if you're a king and some guy shows up and says he's a prince, you're going to need to know which kingdom he's prince of. I mean, really, you'd already know all the nearby kingdoms and the kings and the royal families. So this plan should never have gotten close to even getting to the point where we begin this story. I mean, he did zero research on this guy. The king did. And now we know why the princess had to go visit him alone. But that should have been a red flag right there. The king should have been like, I'd like to visit you too. We'll all have a royal visit. I'll come. The princess will come. All of our guards will come. 
And the fake prince would have had to be like, no, we only have one guest bed in our in our castle, in our kingdom. That's how we do it over there. We're a little we're a little eccentric, but you know, it's how we do it. One guest bed, only the princess could come. She's gotta come alone. But another question, why would this fake prince want to go through so much effort to get this princess to come to him just so he could cook her and eat her? I mean, what is the point of that? Unless they're actually witches and eating a princess is part of some spell. That is a ton of risk and effort just for a cannibalistic meal. It's too too high visibility there. It's not worth it at all. I mean, do you think if you were a cannibal and thief, you'd be trying to stay off the radar a little bit, you know? Maybe don't try to buddy up to the king, pretending to be royalty, and kidnap the princess. And what did he think would happen if he did kidnap and eat the princess? I mean, the king would obviously immediately send a bunch of people into the forest, and they'd find the thief and his band of robbers in their weird murder frat house with their old lady house mom. Terrible plan, and apparently nobody even noticed that the grandmother had disappeared the day before. The one who then gets murdered and they take all the rings. Nobody ever mentioned her again. I gotta say, the security in this kingdom is terrible. The royal grandmother is easily kidnapped and murdered, and the princess is tricked and nearly kidnapped through a plan that could have been very easily uncovered right from the start. I mean, this king has some work to do on the security front, but I do know one thing. I bet this princess is going to take security real seriously when she gets in charge, and she is never going back into the fucking forest ever again. She was afraid of the forest before. Nah, she is like, fuck the forest from now on. She is an open sky princess from here on out. And this king better follow up on anyone who says they're royalty. Just ask a couple follow-up questions, you know? Don't take their word for it. If someone's like, hey, I'm a prince. All right, so the intended lesson here seems to be that things are not always as they appear. People are not always as they appear. There's a difference between appearance and what people say and the reality of a situation. So the person who presented himself as a prince was, in fact, a murderous cannibal thief, which is definitely one of the worst things a person can be. I mean, that difference of appearance or how someone presents themselves versus reality is a damn good lesson, and I think the story does a pretty good job of illustrating that lesson, actually. Personally, I would add a few more concrete, actionable lessons on top of this that the story kind of implies, such as if you're unsure about a potential love interest, bring a couple friends when you visit them. Make it a group thing. You know, if someone insists that you come to visit them alone or make the journey alone, that is a trap. That's a fucking trap right there. Don't go. That person's going to eat you. This is where social media and the internet are your friend. Do your research. There's weirdos out there. Whenever you go out to meet anyone, tell a friend exactly where you're going and check in with them. If you don't want to go through a forest, don't go through a fucking forest. Whether that's a metaphorical forest or a literal forest. But metaphorically or otherwise, I will leave you with this. Nobody who really loves you is going to make you go through a forest alone. That is modern day dating advice, courtesy of Shadow Bear and the Brothers Grimm. Stay safe out there, folks. Always use a condom. All right, let's adapt this thing. So, this definitely feels like a movie. Part of me wants to make this modern day. But I just think it would be more fun to make it olden times, because you can, you can have more fun with a guy pretending to be a prince or a king. We'd have to go too elaborate with it for him to pull it off with the internet and everything today. So we'll have this princess, played by Zoe Kravitz, and her father the king, played by Samuel L. Jackson, of course. So one day, a large group of nobles come to visit this kingdom, led by a fancy prince dressed in elaborate royal attire. And this prince will be played by Thomas Middleditch. And he's got a very obscure, kind of unplaceable accent, and claims to be from a very wealthy, faraway kingdom called Slinklebaum. And he would like to offer his hand in marriage to the lovely princess. And Samuel L. Jackson is skeptical, obviously, because he's never heard of this kingdom of Slinklebaum. But Thomas Middleditch presents a huge amount of gold and overwhelms him with gifts and gold, to the point where Sam Jackson kind of has to believe him, because how else did he get all this stuff? And Thomas finally convinces them by saying, 
that he'd like to take the princess back to his kingdom, and there she can decide for herself if she'd like to live there as queen. And so they agree, and Zoe Kravitz hops into the prince's carriage, and she brings along a few personal guards as well, because that's what would happen in this situation. She's not going alone. So they set out through the forest, and Zoe and Thomas are talking, and Zoe's like, it's odd that I, I've never heard of such a prosperous kingdom, and how is your kingdom so wealthy? And Thomas is like, well, we have lots of very special breed of sheep with the softest golden wool you've ever seen. So, you know, we sell the wool and we trade the wool with the other kingdoms. But people love wool, you know. They can't get enough of it. So we do quite well. He just bullshits answers to all her questions. And so after a few days, Zoe's like, it seems like we've sort of been riding around in circles. Are we lost or something? And Thomas looks surprised and worried for a moment. But... Then he's like, oh no, it's just it's a very winding trail, you know, we're almost there, so, so don't worry, I can see you're very eager. And, and they arrive in Thomas's quote-unquote kingdom, finally, and as they enter, Zoe sees a herd of sheep, and they all just look like they were crudely painted gold. And it, it's really more of just an odd, isolated compound in the middle of a forest, and it looks pretty obvious that they just tried to crudely make everything look nicer than it is, like a wooden shack that's painted to look like it's made of nice stone. And they ride past a, a grand villa, but then one of the walls just detaches and tips over, revealing that there's nothing inside and it's just a fake building. And all the townspeople come out and they sing a song and do a whole choreographed routine. It's all clearly very put on, and it just seems like a very crudely made little fake town. And Zoe can see this, but she thinks he's trying to impress her. So she's like, well, I don't know if I don't marry this guy. Probably not. But he seems harmless and pretty entertaining. So this will be a laugh for a couple days. Just might as well enjoy myself and then go home. And they arrive at the biggest house in the middle of the compound. And some random guy who looks dirty and toothless is just whittling something at the door. And he's like, oh, hey there, Tom. How's it going? And Thomas Middleditch is like, <clears throat> You will address me as your highness, lowly peasant. How, how dare you be so informal with me, especially in the presence of such an esteemed guest as the lovely princess. And the guy just jumps up and is like, oh, yeah, right, right. Your highness, of course, your highness. I forgot that was this week, your highness. And this sort of thing goes on. And Zoe's like, I'll, I'll just have some fun with this. Head home in a day or two, no problem. Until that night when a maid comes into Zoe's room to tidy up, and she's suddenly like, Princess, you, you have to get out of here. These people, they aren't who they say they are. And Zoe's like, I, I know, it's not a real kingdom, and he's not a real prince, but they're pretty silly, they're funny, so I'll, I'll play along with it and just be on my way tomorrow. But the maid is like, no, it's way worse than that. I'm from your kingdom, but they kidnapped me as a child. When I went to pick mushrooms in the forest one day, they kidnapped me and they killed the rest of my family. That They're an insane cult. Thieves and murderers. They kidnap people and they steal their land and their gold. And that's how they got all the gold that they used to convince the king that they were royalty. But no, they're just a cult. Their beliefs are crazy. They try to do spells and witchcraft, but they're terrible at it and nothing ever works. And Thomas is their leader and he's convinced everyone that if they can sacrifice a princess, then they'll finally get magic powers. So you got to get out of here. And so Zoe is like, I don't know if I can believe you. This is, all, this is all just really overwhelming. And the maid says, I would never lie to you for I am one of your people. And I can prove it because all I have left of my past is this necklace. And so he looks at the necklace and says, like, my God, this, this is the ancestral necklace of our kingdom's nobility. I remember when you and your family went missing. We must escape from this place. And so they go out the door where Zoe's personal security guards are waiting and she tells them everything. And they quietly sneak out of the fake castle in the middle of the night, which, to their surprise, actually isn't that hard, because for some reason, nobody seems to be around. As, as, you, as you will remember from the original story, fortunately, nothing happened. And so they reach the stables, but they hear a commotion, they see firelight. And the maid is like, no, no, they're doing some horrifying magic rituals, it's too dangerous, please, please, let's just go. But Zoe is like, I need to see, I need to see what they're up to. And so they sneak up. And Zoe peers around a hay bale to see the entire cult all painted in, in black and red, and they're standing in a big circle, and she looks in the middle of the circle to see a line of them, including Thomas, the fake prince, 
and they're they're all they're each everyone in the line is just tossing a frog into the air and catching it again as everyone in the circle sings a song and, and chants and beats drums. And then the drums stop, and Thomas announces, Now that we are done with froggy tosses, we will give our weekly sacrifice and write the scales of justice. And they bring out a bunch of people who they kidnapped from nearby areas, and they tie them to posts. And then Thomas points to the dirty fellow who had been whittling something on the doorstep, and he says, You! You nearly ruined our plan by giving it away to the princess. Everything else had gone perfectly. The town looks great. The golden sheep looks super convincing. Everyone remembered the choreography to the song we sang when she arrived, but you nearly ruined it. So you must go to the shack of shame. And the guy is like, no, please, no. But they force him into a small wooden shack at the edge of the woods, and everyone is quiet for a moment. And then the shack just explodes. And, and Thomas starts dancing, and everyone around cheers. And Thomas shouts, Today we sacrifice these people, and tomorrow we will sacrifice the princess. And everyone roars in applause and starts beating the drums again. And Thomas takes out two pistols, and he starts dancing around and with the two pistols. And he shoots the kidnapped people tied to the post as sacrifices. And he's also just firing the guns into the air as he dances around, and everyone's cheering. And let's say he even just randomly shoots a couple of the cult members cheering in the circle just for no reason. He's just dancing and gesticulating with the guns, and, and he shoots them. You know, they're cult members. They're super into it. They don't mind at all. They're just like, I've been blessed by the ritual dancing of Thomas Middleditch. And so Zoe, she's like, all right, these people are insane. We gotta go. So she runs back to the stables where the guards say they don't have any horses, just donkeys, because this place sucks. So they hop onto the donkeys... No offense to donkeys. Donkeys are pretty great too, but, you know, a little less regal than the horse. So they take their donkeys and they ride through the night with the maid telling them how to get back. Because just as Zoe suspected, Thomas just had them ride around in circles, so it seemed like they were going a really far away. They arrive back in the kingdom and tell Samuel L. Jackson what's going on. And shortly after, Thomas Middleditch shows up again. And he's like, hey, so we actually lost a princess. Have you seen her by chance? And Zoe Kravitz comes out and reveals that she knows everything and knows that they were going to kill her. And Thomas is like, what? That's, that's crazy. We'd never do something like that. And then the kidnapped maid comes out and says, I know what you do. You killed my family and kidnapped me and I've been terrorizing people for years, but no more. And the maid draws a bow and arrow and Thomas tries to use his magic powers to attack them and make himself invincible but he doesn't have any magic powers, so after some dramatic words and gestures on his part, he is summarily shot with an arrow and falls and dies. And they save everyone from the cult compound, and they rid the kingdom of this terror. The end. And that will do it for this week's story session. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Come on back next week for a story titled... Hair Corbs. Hair cor Her Corbus? Not 100% sure on the pronunciation, spelled H E R R space K O R B E S. So presumably it's a tale about a man named Corbs. So come on back next week for that. We'll see what Corbs gets up to. My name is Zach Stewart, and these are the Shadow Bear Story Sessions.